Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Chris Valentin. For more information about this podcast and other resources, please visit iBethel.org. I've been doing a series on empowering women. Actually, I did a series some years ago, about three years ago, on called um, uh, something. Oh, God's Most Beautiful Creation. And I did, I think, five or six weeks, a uh, five or six week the- uh, series. But I didn't teach on the theology of uh, Paul's letters to the Corinthians and to, um, to Ephesus um, through Timothy and Titus at Creed. And um, through some circumstances, which I'm not going to go through again, because I taught this morning, first session, and it was terrible. And I decided, I'm, there is no wisdom in the second kick of a mule, I'm not going to do that twice. So instead of uh, reiterating everything I taught uh, two weeks ago, I did part two, I did, I did part one two weeks ago of uh, the theology of empowering women. And uh, I thought it was, uh, came out pretty good last week. Uh, two weeks ago, you can get online and get that. I think it's still online for free. And uh, I did. I talked about um, the book of Corinthians and Paul's. The, and we we spent much time on Paul's exhortation in First Corinthians 14 for women to remain silent in the church. And uh, it, how many of you got a chance to hear that? Yeah, I, I don't say this about my teaching very often, but it happened to be pretty good. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> And I, I, Kathy can tell you that I was not excited about teaching it, but I felt from the Lord that I was to do that. What I did in first service was, I asked how many people were, didn't hear that, and over half the people hadn't heard it. And so I, I thought, I said I'm going to do some review, and I reviewed till the last three minutes of the, of the message, and then just thought, that was, I'm not doing that, people need to come to church. <laughs> I'm joking about the people need to come to church part. I just felt like it was all repeat, and I, I don't want to do that. So there's some really good foundation that you, need, you really need to have. That the, the challenge is, is that this piece that I'm about to teach, it actually fits together with another piece that kind of lays, not kind of, it does lay line upon line and precept upon precept. And so... It's going to be a little bit of a like, whoa, how about this verse, this and this, and he hasn't addressed that, and probably most of that was addressed in the session I did two weeks ago. And so I'm really sorry that you're not going to get that. You can also get this book called Fashion to Rain. I'm not trying to sell books. I am, actually, but, <laughs> but not at this moment. Um, this has everything I'm teaching in it, much better than I'm teaching it publicly, and um, it has uh, a whole bunch of... Uh, references and it references Greek and uh, Hebrew scholars and people that I've quoted. And so, um, anyway, would someone like this book? Awesome, you can buy it in the bookstore. Just give this book to somebody, would you? Just, it's your birthday? Yeah, oh, it's her birthday too, so just give it to, maybe you should give it to a guy. Um, guys should read that book. I mean, actually, I think men should read that book more than women, because um, we're, we're the ones who have issues most of the time, <laughs> all the time in my marriage. Anyway, uh, I, I had this experience, I want to tell you about this experience. Um, several years ago, Danny and I were in Latin America. I, I really don't want you to know the country, so I'm changing some of the details on purpose, but the, the root of the story is absolutely true. But um, the, some of the details I, I have intentionally changed so that you won't know where it is because, because uh, it's, it's, the context that, it's the content that I actually want you to know. So we were in a Latin American country and we were doing a conference together and, um, and, I, and, and I was to be the opening speaker at this um, very large network of churches and um, by the way, I speak a lot of Latin American network of churches, so you, know, you may remember one trip I was on, and I'm like, yeah, well, it's probably not the one you think. I hope it's not the one you think. You're probably hoping it's not the one I th- you think. And uh, so anyway, the night before, I, I, you know, Danny and I had flown over uh, there together, and um, we, we kind of talked through what we were going to share and, and did all that. And, and then uh, the night before the conference, uh, we got there the night before, and I, and I had a very vivid dream. 
Uh, and I had this dream. So I don't know why I cry. I got too close to build. <laughs> no, I cry all the time. <laughs> Used to be able to be hard hearted. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna be, I'm, I'm good now, I can just do it. Okay, so, so I had this very vivid dream. And I dream, by the way, uh, almost every night. I have a nightlife. And um, <laughs> I actually get paid to dream, you know. I'm a prophet, so a lot better than talking to people. And, uh, and in this dream, I saw, uh, I, I, knew, I knew the dream, I knew I was in Latin America in this dream. And I saw these women, they were in their homes and they were, they were all bound. They were all, they were in, in tattered clothes and they were, uh, they, um, some of them were, were tied up um, and, and they were just super restricted. And, um, and there's a lot more detail to the dream, but just, just you'll get the gist of it. And, uh, and it was just like all over, like I could see into the homes of, of entire countries and I could see the women were, they were, they were oppressed, they were suppressed, they were reduced, and they were re-identified, misidentified. And then um, all over, uh, and it's kind of like a, a Google view of, a, 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 of the map, you know, when you can Google back and see like whole continents. It's crazy because I could see whole continents, but at the same time I could see specific areas, and I saw church bells ringing. You know, like the old church bells they had in a, like those ch- in the chapels. I started seeing and hearing in the dream church bells ringing, and um, as the church bells rang, uh, women began. It was like a it was like a supernatural summoning, and women began to come out of their houses into the streets, and they were bound and they were tattered and they were broken and they were depressed and discouraged and their heads were down and they began to make their way towards the church and as they made their way towards the church the, as they got closer to the the physical building of the church their 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 um just uh their 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 bonds uh just began to come off like just just fall to the ground like no one's touching them just began to fall to the ground and they're their attire began to change, so they just, and they began to be uh, dressed in, in, in white satin and, and beautiful garments, and their faces began to shine, and, and, as they, and the church, uh, the doors of the front church, uh, the, door, uh, the front doors of the church were, were open all over, all over Latin America. The front doors of the church were open, and there was two um, thrones. I, I know this sounds a little weird, just try to bear with me. There was two thrones, and there was a man sitting on one throne, and there was a there was the other throne was empty, and it was dusty, and it was uh, uh, no one. It was beautiful, but it obviously hadn't ever either ever been sat in or haven't been sat in for years. And in my in the dream, I knew that that was the woman's place. And so, as they entered into these. Uh, these, these chapels, these uh, churches, as the women entered, they, the, 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 man, the, the men who were all on these like thrones with a throne next to them, uh, thrones too strong word, uh, but something like that, place of authority, uh, they, they had these scepters, they were, they were like red, uh, long, beautiful, with red scepter on the top, and, and they began to hand these red scepters to the women. And as they handed them to the women and invite them to sit on these seats, and the men went over and, and physically dust, dusted the chair off and handed them the scepter. And, and the women would, would sit at, uh, on the seat, on the throne, throne-like seat, and when the man sat down, another scepter from heaven that was blue was handed to him. And then the dream... The, uh, part the vision part of the dream ended, and I began to hear a co- conversation between God and somebody. I, I don't know who he was talking to. But, but, he, the, con- but the conversation, it was like two people talking, and one of them was God. And God said, Latin America is going to experience the greatest revival in, in, the, in the history of their country. Or, or, and it was like a warning 
like a feminist movement that will be worse than any feminist movement in the, in the history of the world. And the church will, has an opportunity to make a difference between, the church can cut off this, uh, I, I know, let me, just, uh, let me fix this part. Uh, it, it, it was like there was a demonic spirit speaking, well, that's how it started, and the demonic, and, and I could hear this demonic plan about women rising up in rebellion and taking their rightful place. And, and the Lord said, the worst feminist movement the world's ever seen is about to arise, but I have a plan. And, that, and then the vision was the plan. God said, but, but my church is going to intervene, stand in the place, empower women to the rightful role. And, 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 and I, then I began to realize that the enemy had developed a plan that was trying to thwart the plan that God had already had. And that was to empower women all over Latin America and to put them in the rightful place and that the greatest revival in Latin America would come through empowering women and through the unity of men and women. So anyway, long, long, much longer the story than I even told and that was already long. So we go to the church and we had been there before. I had been there years before. So I ha- had a good idea that um, these, these, this network of churches did not allow women, did not have a very high place for women, especially when it came to any kind of teaching or authority, anything like that. And so um, we did the first session. I think Danny ended up doing the first session. And at lunchtime, they, they, they gathered all of the leaders of the network. And they, you know, when we sat for lunch, and obviously through translators, I said, do you have anything that you'd like to share with us? And, you know, I'd already shared with Danny on the way to church, and he just looked at me like, oh, <laughs> why do I always travel with you and find pain, you know? So, um, so I, they said, you know, do you, do you have anything? And, you know, I, we kind of looked at each other, and Danny looked at, over at me like, you know, okay, you know, we'll do this together. I'll fall on the sword with you, you know? So there was about 12 or 15 leaders sitting at this large table and everybody was laughing and joking and they really love us. They love Danny and I and, and Danny's session was amazing. His first session was amazing. And so I said, well, I have something, but I don't think you're going to like it. And they said, was well, it from the Lord? And I said, um, I believe it is. <laughs> it, from there on, it went, she went downhill. So I shared the, uh, the dream with them in more detail than I just shared with you. And, and um, it was uh, obviously, again, through the translator, and it just got completely and totally silent. And uh, so we sat there, and, you know, I wanted to hold hands with Danny. <laughs> Danny just w- looking down like this. It got completely and totally silent, and we sat there for, you know, it seemed like eternity. I'm sure it was three or four or five minutes and uh, nobody said anything and we were also having lunch so I just put my head down and was eating and I'm like you know it's one of those things like I wish I wouldn't have done that actually and so uh, the head of the of the networks he stood up at the table and he said I don't believe this is the word of the Lord and women have their place their place is not in leadership and and he just started going off all the stuff. So I'm like, I don't know what to do from here. I know what I would do at my house, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do at your house. So he just went on to say that he felt like that was not, that we were to judge prophecy and that wasn't a prophecy from God and, and that women have the rightful place and, and basically that they're not allowed to teach or exercise authority over man, so obviously they wouldn't have a throne-like place or authority in the church. So I kind of sat there for a little while. And, you know, I kept looking over at Danny, but he was looking down. <laughs> Just trying to, like, let's some, get some synergy over what we're going to do here. And uh, finally, finally, I just said, uh, well, sir, it, it, it's okay for you to be wrong. It's okay for you to be wrong. We can still be friends. Well, that, that wasn't working. And um, so the short story was we ended up in a very uh, uh, strong 
conversation that we were having with the table that many of the Latin American, uh, Latin, I mean, yeah, the people got involved in, the leaders. It was a very passionate discussion that they were not winning. And so they said, uh, so we, we left from the lunch and they said, do not teach this or share this vision with any of our people publicly. And of course, we wouldn't do that. So we said, no problem, we, we won't do that. And I told them, by the way, I wouldn't have shared this if you didn't ask me, do you have something? You asked, so I told you. <laughs> and so anyway, um, but by, by dinner that next, that evening, but you know, they were, they were not in a good mood. And, uh, and they said, uh, we're going to fly our theologian in to meet with you tomorrow morning. We're going to cancel the morning session to meet with you and Danny. And I'm, <laughs> This is not going to be fun. And I said to him, listen, believe whatever you want. You asked me for the word. I gave you what I got for a word. It, it, you know, we don't need to do this. And they were like, we need to do this. I'm like, all right. So, um, so they did. He came. Uh, they flew him in. Their, their top theologian, Greek something, Hebrew whatever, <laughs> barely English, you know, so, um, and he spoke English, which was great. So, we, so, you know, and we, 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 they canceled the morning session and we ended up in this meeting. And uh, he's a very big man and we're sitting down and he stands up and he begins to not ask me, he begins to exhort me in my um, defiance of being true to the scriptures. And so, um, that went on for about seven or eight minutes. And I, I frankly was pretty getting angry. I'm sure that's shocking to, to all of you. <laughs> and I finally said to him, um, you know what? You actually don't know what you're talking about. And he said, he kind of went back like, and I said, um, you know, here's the challenge. I've, I've been to your churches and um, uh, women speak in your churches. I've seen them talk when they come through the doors. I see them talking like I was in this conference today and your women were talking in the church. And actually the Bible says women keep silent in the church. They are not allowed to speak. And yet your women talk and also they even sing. I've seen them lead worship. They sing in church, which is a lot like talking. So I said to them, and uh, so I, and I, I opened up the 1 Corinthians 14 and I read verbatim exactly the scripture that he was trying to point out. That, and I, I said, actually he wasn't pointing out the silent scripture, he was pointing out Timothy scripture, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes. And I read for him, to him verbatim, women should not speak in the church, they are forbidden to speak in the church. If they have any questions, let them ask their husband, for a woman is not permitted to speak, but remain silent in the church. So I read that to him, and I said, uh, you believe the Bible? He said, yes. I said, that's funny because you're not following it. So you have a problem because you're trying to tell me that you believe in the authority of the Bible, and yet your women get to speak in your churches. He said, well, that doesn't mean speak. I said, really? Wow. My Bible says speak. What does yours say? He said, speak, but it doesn't mean speak. I said, so what you're saying is, is that you've decided that, that Paul had some context to what he was saying, and therefore you can't, you, you, you can't specifically, in the way it was written, apply it to your church. Is that true? He said, that's right. Yeah, Paul was talking about, and he gave the, the traditional view, that women were on one side of the church and men on the other, and that when women wanted to know what, when they had questions, they were yelling across the aisle, and therefore Paul was addressing that specific issue, and that's why he told women they weren't supposed to speak. I said, that's funny, because uh, none of that's in the Bible. Nothing about women being on one side. Paul didn't say, hey, you're on one side, you're on the other, please stop talking across the aisle. I said, so what you're saying is, is that you believe there was some context to that, and that's why you feel free to, to uh, modify the context, because you realize that that actually wouldn't work in your churches and it probably wouldn't work in any church 
anywhere, and it probably isn't what happened at the Corinthian church either. Probably women did speak because they got to prophesy and they got to, and they got to pray, and we know that because of 1 Corinthians 11, which comes from before 1 Corinthians 14. Paul said that women can pray and prophesy as long as they're in right order. And in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, he said you can all prophesy, and he was talking to men and women. We know that because the book of Corinthians was actually written to both male and female. So you have smart enough to figure out the context of Paul's exhortation, and you have, you have stayed with the spirit of the word, but... Now you take this word about Timothy that women can't teach or exercise authority and you decide that you, you have redefined, you, have, you felt permission to apply that, <laughs> apply that specifically to your congregation, but 1 Corinthians 14, you've decided that it's okay to, ha- to give it context. I said, that's very interesting that you get to choose. So, so when it fits your doctrine, you get to choose to read it this way. When it doesn't fit your doctrine, you get to choose to read it that way. That's a very interesting context. He looks at me. He said, well, you just don't understand the Bible. I said, no, you, I think you are the one that's having a problem here. And we ended up in four hours discussion. Of which Danny mostly prayed. (laughs) We left as friends. And we have been invited back. With the subject of, please do not give that prophetic word to um, anyone. Um, And so I I want to talk a little bit about Timothy's uh, word. And set it in its context and tell you what I think and why I think that. And, um, and honestly, again, I'm, I'm not really not trying to sell books, but the book does a much better job, and you haven't heard part one and part two, so you're hearing part three without a whole bunch of foundation. So I don't know if you haven't heard that, how, um, how uh, much influence this is going to have on you. So let's read it. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. These are Paul's exhortation um, to Timothy. And he writes, a woman, must, uh, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created. Listen to the reasoning. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was Adam. It was not Adam who was deceived, but it was the woman being deceived. She fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Okay, so um, let let me give you a a, a little context, and I I gave this context in in the last session, but uh, you need it for the book of Timothy too. First of all, let me just explain a, a couple things. Um, Paul wrote to three different cultures. He wrote to Roman culture, Jewish culture, and Greek culture. He wrote nine letters. He wrote 13 letters to nine different geographic locations. And he had something to say about women in authority in only three, in only three geographic locations. And they, those three geographic locations had one thing in common. They all had a Greek goddess as the senior god of their city. So Paul's writing to Timothy. Timothy is the senior leader of the church of Ephesus who has Artemis or Diana, same, same God, and she's the God of fertility. She's a multi-breasted statue, and she's thought to be the one that is the mother of creation. She's the mother of creation. By the way, there is no father because in Greek mythology, the goddess is over gods. So they had male gods and they had goddesses. And the goddesses had more power than the gods because all of, all of nature came through Mother Earth, came through Mother God. Are you with me? So this is the, there's much more to it, but for this, that's the short version. So Timothy is pastoring this church in Ephesus, which is really the capital of, of, uh, of polytheism in the area of uh, Greek mythology. And this is a very famous city, and women 
one of the things that happened is that women would come to the city specifically to have their children. They, they came to the city to have their children because the death rate among women, and not just the mortality of the, of, 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 of the birth rate of children, but the death rate among women when they gave birth to children was so high that, that Greek women would come to Ephesus because Artemis would protect them through childbirth. Did you get that? So many of the Greek women wouldn't convert to Christianity because they were afraid that they would die when they were bearing children. Which is why Paul says that women will be preserved through the bearing of children. The word preserved is actually the word saved. They will be saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith, love, and sanctity. And the point he's making, and we'll start there because it's very simple to explain, is that they no longer need Artemis. If they receive Jesus Christ, they are saved. Not saved like go to heaven. Of course that's true. It's not like if you, give, if you bear children, you'll get saved. How many of you know well, that would be a weird doctrine? <laughs> and so he, he's saying to the women, he's saying to Timothy, tell the women of, uh, of Ephesus that they don't need the goddess of Artemis to keep them safe. They will be saved through, they will be preserved, they will be kept safe, they will be so, the word is sozoed, they will be saved through childbirth, and therefore, all they need to do is trust in God and have a great relationship with Him, and there's no problem, they won't die as they're bearing children. So that's been taught as all kinds of weird things, but that's what that means. Now, the second uh, part is, is probably the more contested part, and that is, um, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Um, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Now, here's part of the, the struggle that we have, and I'll get back to that, the, that verse in, in a minute. But here's part of the struggle we have with that. Um, when, uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, we have the Holy Spirit being poured out, and the specific um, exhortation and prophecy to, to, uh, to, through, through Peter, quoting the book of Joel, is, in the last days I'll pour out my Spirit, on all mankind. Get this. This is radical. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, this was, this was the, the a beginning proclamation of the first outpouring of the Spirit. It came with sons and daughters, young men and old men, bond servants, and wealthy people. In other words, God said, I'm going to move on everybody. <laughs> I'm going to move on everybody. And then, so, so it's, we're, we're talking about the move of the Spirit. This move of the Spirit was on everybody. And when we talk about women not being able to teach or exercise authority, and I, I, I want to first of all show you that that was to a specific church because of a specific problem. Because, for instance, if you'll turn to chapter 18 of Acts, verse 24, let me give you just some idea. Now, um, now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, eloquent man, a man uh, came, to Ephesus, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. Did you see where he came to? He came to Ephesus, where Timothy was, who, that was the same city that Paul wrote to and said, I don't allow a woman to teach or exercise authority, are you with me? So he's at Ephesus, and he's teaching. This man was instructed... This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now how many of you understand, we have a great man of God speaking the word accurately, but he only knew the baptism of John. And it says Priscilla, named first, in this case, and Aquila, her husband, took him aside and taught him. How many of you know that if man couldn't teach, if a woman couldn't teach a man, then Priscilla would not be named there? We, we go on to um, Acts 21, verse 8. It says that Philip had four prophetess daughters. Uh, some of your uh, Bibles decide to change the word prophetess to uh, uh, prophecy. Four daughters who prophesied. 
But actually, it actually says that he had four prophetess daughters. Now, why is that interesting? Well, first of all, that's not, there's not much argument there because we know there are Old, there are Old Testament prophecies, pro, prophetesses. We had Anna, we had Deborah, we had many Old, Tef, Old Testament prophetesses. But what's interesting is in the New Testament, how many of you know that there's a new role for the prophet in the New Testament? How many of you understand that? Ephesians chapter 4 said he gave some as apostles and some as prophets. And some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. To do what? To equip the saints to do the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to the, to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. What's the point I'm making? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, but apostles and prophets equip the saints to do the work of service. Now how many of you understand that there is no exclusion for a female prophetess? In other words, if prophets equip the, the saints, then certainly prophetesses get included in that because there is no male or female in Christ. And how do prophets equip the saints? They teach them, they equip them, and if you go on to read the rest of Ephesians 4 from ver, ver, verse 11 on, you'll see that it is the prophets and the apostles and the evangelists, pastors and teachers that equip the saints, and there's about seven or eight mentioned uh, by name prophetesses in the New Testament and there's four right here uh, Philip who was the only named evangelist had four daughters who were prophetesses now how many of you understand that first of all if you're a prophetess and you're equipping the saints the first thing you would have to do is talk <laughs> so the whole thing that women can't speak in church would be a bummer because you would have to go outside the church to speak and if you're supposed to equip the saints, then how many know your ministry wouldn't just be outside the church? It'd be inside the church. And so we have, um, we have uh, in, in Luke uh, chapter 2, you can write these down if you like, verse 36, we have Anna the prophetess. prophetess. We have, in Exodus 15, we have Miriam the prophetess. In Deborah, I'm sorry, in Judges chapter 4, we have Deborah the prophetess who's also the judge of Israel. Now, for those of you that don't know a lot about the Old Testament, the judge means she was in charge. She was the head of the country, the prime minister, the president, the king. Are you with me? The queen in this case. There was no queens in those days. So whoever was the judge was in charge of the country. Does it make sense that a woman in the Old Testament, by God's call, could be the leader of a country, but she couldn't be an elder in a church of 50. <laughs> Just think through that, okay. I'm getting back, to, I'll get back to what's, what the issue is. And, and it just goes on. Second Kings 22, there's another prophetess mentioned. In Romans chapter uh, 16, verse 7, Paul greets uh, Junus and says, My kinsmen and my fellow prisoner who are outstanding among the apostles and who are also in Christ." before me. And so he greets a woman, Junus. It's, there is no debate whether it's a man or a woman. Some of your Bibles say, there's a, well, this could be a man. You have to change it. It'd be like calling a man Sue. <laughs> you have to really be convinced that women can't be apostles to make Junus a man's name. It would be very odd. It wouldn't be like calling Chris, calling them Chris, and that could be for a man or woman. This is a woman's name. And, it said, and Paul it greets her as somebody who's great among the apostles. Are you with me? And so, and then, um, you, you know, there, there's other things that are pretty awesome. Like, how many think that Timothy's pretty awesome? Do you know where he got his faith? Not from his father. From his grandmother and his mother. So how many of you understand that when Timothy gets this exhortation about women teaching and exercising authority, how many know it's his mother and grandmother who taught him the ways of God? <laughs> it was Jesus who listened to his mother and, told, <laughs> and said, make wine, when he said, this isn't my time. And she said, listen to your mother. <laughs> that was the son of God. <laughs> It's Proverbs 6. This is the Old Testament. I mean, isn't the New Testament more empowering to everybody than the Old Testament? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Proverbs 6.20. My son, observe the commandments of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. 
Proverbs 3, 31, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. Now, how many of you love Proverbs 31? Ladies, you should all have your hands up, right? Probably, unless, unless you're like, she's a workaholic, so I'm not raising my hands. <laughs> Depends on how you read it. Well, I don't know if you, if you know this, but the name Lemuel means belonging to God. And Proverbs 1 starts out with, these are the Proverbs of Solomon. King Lemuel is the, is the nickname, uh, it, 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 it's kind of the, uh, um, it's not a nickname, it, it's, it's, an, it's a name, it's another name for Solomon. In other words, Proverbs 31, King Lemuel is, it was Solomon and his mother was Bathsheba. And how many know she had a few things to say about how kings behave because she ended up in an adulterous relationship that killed her first husband that she loved. So she had some good instruction for this new king. Proverbs 31 is what Bathsheba taught Solomon. Hello, the wisest man in the world included it in his book of wisdom, what his mother Bathsheba taught him. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 says there's, no, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. How, how many of you know that when we're in Christ, we're all one in Christ Jesus? So let's go back and just quickly, over the next few minutes, just talk through a few of the um, uh, translations of the verses. First of all, when Paul says... To Timothy, um, a woman must, must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Um, the first thing is the, um, well, I'll, I'll skip to this part. The word um, authority, I do not allow a woman to exercise authority, is a very, it's very interesting because in, in the in the Bible, there's 47 words for the word authority. There's 47 different words for the word authority. The word authority used in Timothy, when Paul says to Timothy, I don't allow a woman to exercise authority, that's the only time that word authority is used in the entire Bible. And that word originally meant, let me see if I can, I'm sure I have it right here. That word originally meant to, to murder with one's own hand or to commit suicide. As time passed, it meant the one who acts on his own authority or governs or exercises dominion. It came later on, to, uh, in fact, later on it, it, it meant, um, I'm sorry, that's good enough. There's more to it than that. But the point is, is that if Paul would have meant authority like in a healthy way, he had 46 other words to choose from. He could have said, you know, I don't allow a woman to exercise authority. In other words, I don't allow a woman to be in charge of anything. He would have used a different, different word. This word meant, to, it, it began uh, from, it came from the root word to mean to slap with the back of a hand. And it meant that it meant to be dominant. And that, and it also meant that, uh, that the origin of authority came from women. Now, all of that sounds t- totally weird unless you understand that this is a Greek city with the goddess Artemis, and women ruled men in this city. The Greeks elevated women to a place where they ruled over society. That's why you'll notice in the book of Acts, Paul encounters the woman, uh, um, Lydia, who has purple garments, and it says, and she was very influential in her city. How many know you don't have influential women in Jewish cities? You don't have influential women in Roman cities. You have influential women in Greek cities because the Greek women ruled men. And they believed that authority flowed from women to men. When Paul talks about to Timothy that and his, his, the context of his, um, this, I don't allow women to teach or exercise authority, but to receive instruction. For it was, listen to this, for it was Adam who was first created, then Eve. Why does he say that? I just told you. Because Greek mythology said the woman was created first. And listen, why does it matter who's created first? It matters 
in Greek mythology because they thought women had authority over men because they were created first. So Paul is correcting a specific situation in which women were trying to take their role in the church like they did in the temple of Diana where they exercised domination over men and they were still trying to take their cultural domination that was still prevalent at Ephesus and Corinth and also at Creed where they were in charge of men and they brought it into the church and they would say to the men, listen, we were created first. And Paul said, listen, no, they weren't created first. It was Adam who was first created and then Eve. Are you with me? The point he's trying to make, and then he goes on to say, it wasn't Adam who was deceived, but it was Eve. How many of you know Adam wasn't deceived, he just disobeyed? <laughs> I don't know what's worse, being deceived or knowing what you're doing is wrong and doing it anyway. Well, we do know what's worse because we're under the sin of Adam, not the sin of Eve. So he isn't saying, no, let me make this point. He isn't saying, listen, Adam was more righteous than Eve. He was saying, these women who are telling you that they should have dominion over you and have authority over you are wrong. And remember, Eve was deceived. Are you, are you getting me? He's not talking about all women in general are deceived forever because how many of you know there's more men deceived than there are women? Look at our prisons. They're not full of women. They're full of men. Do you know that 98.4% of all violent crimes done in America are done by men? Listen, what is the devil's plan? Steal, kill, destroy. Who's doing that better? I'm not saying women are inherently righteous. I'm just saying in culture, who creates more destruction, men or women? This is not even close. It's not an argument. I had someone come up and argue with me. Well, they're both sinners. I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about who creates more destruction. How many women have started wars? I mean, just think through it, you know? How many, how many women were at the crucifixion? How many women crucified Jesus? None. It was all men. So, you know, if you're going to make a case that, you know, well, women are, you know, they're just more easily deceived. No, his point is that these women who are trying to dominate you, who are coming out of, uh, coming out of Greek mythology and coming into the church and saying, we should have this place where we dominate you. He's saying, listen, remember Eve was deceived and so are these women. And therefore, I don't allow them to, to teach or exercise authority. Why? Because of their filter. Are you with me? Because women taught everywhere in the New Testament. Women taught, they prophesied, they were, they were prophetesses, they equipped the saints. There's a specific problem that Paul's dealing with, just like my friend was right about Corinthians. He was right to not, he was right that there was context for women, women be silent in the church. There was context for that. And I taught a whole session on that. He was right. My friend, my Latin American friend was right. He's right about that. There was context. There is no reason why a woman shouldn't be able to speak in church because the rest of the book of Corinthians says that a woman can prophesy. She can, she can, she can um, pray in church as long as she's in right order. So there's no reason in 1 Corinthians 14 that after 14 chapters of telling, saying you can all prophesy, you can all encourage you can all teach and then he goes on before this verse and he says when, when you come together in corinthians he says when you come together each one has a teaching has a psalm has a, a, a an encouraging an encouragement this is written to men and women it doesn't make sense that in first corinthians 14 he would suddenly say well but you can't speak hey each one has a teaching each one he didn't say each man he said each one so my friend is right. There's a context. Paul's speaking to a context. I don't agree with my friend's idea of the context, but my point is, it was right for him to say, oh, are you speaking into a specific issue? Here's my point. So was Timothy. Paul was, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he was speaking to a specific issue. He was speaking to people coming out of Greek mythology. And in that culture, and that's the only place that Paul restricted women is in Greek culture. Are you following me? 39, 40 authors authored the Bible. 39 of them empower women. 
one of them spoke to specific situations in which they restricted or seemed to restrict women. One author. Three scriptures. And we've made a whole culture out of it. For 2,000 years. <laughs> yeah, nervously we're laughing. And the women are all just wanting to jump, jump up and shout. Listen to this. I'll, I'll end with this verse. This is Psalm 68, 11. The Lord gives the command, the women who proclaim the good tidings are a great host. This is the Old Testament, man. Come on. The Lord gives the command, the women who proclaim good tidings are a great host. Kings of armies flee. They flee. All of us who are married, we understand this. All of us men who are married, we get this. Kings of armies flee, they flee. And she who remains at home will divide the spoil. When you lie down among the sheepfolds, you will be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and its pinions with glistening gold. When, they, when the Almighty scattered the kings there, it was snowing at Zelman. I love that. The Lord gives the command and the women proclaim the glad tidings and they are a great host and the kings flee from them. That's just a good word right there. Why don't you stand up? <laughs> Jesus doesn't just love women. He empowers them. People say things like, how come there's 12 disciples and they're all men? Listen, if you put a woman in charge of something in Jewish culture, no one would follow. They oppressed women and thought they were a possession. It wouldn't even make sense. In fact, they'd probably be murdered. So some things are just dumb. But how many know, without a title, Jesus definitely taught women. And women definitely taught men. As a matter of fact, it was the woman at the well that went to Samaria. <laughs> And said, you got to hear what this guy told me. How many know she was teaching? How many know when Jesus rose from the dead, none of his disciples were there? None. Not one. After Jesus, three and a half years of teaching, hey, guys, I'm going to die. But on the third day, be ready. I'll, I'm coming out of the grave. Oh, yeah, they believed him. Not one person showed up at the grave on the third day except for a woman. Yep. It's a woman. And you know what she did? She had to go teach the men. Hey, remember what he said? I just saw Jesus. What? No way. How many of you know there were still 11 disciples left because Judas had hung himself? How many disciples even checked out the tomb after Mary told them, I saw Jesus, he's alive? Only two people ran back to the tomb, Peter and John. What happened to the other nine? What am I getting at? I'm saying, <laughs> Who's spiritual? Oh, you know, us men, you know, we got to be leading the church. Uh, we know more about the things of God. You missed the resurrection. I mean, please stop. If it wasn't for women, you'd still be looking around in an empty tomb wondering what the heck happened to you. I mean, if nothing else, I mean, just hit your head against the wall and say, wake up, you know. This, this, some of the things we just do are just stupid. Uh, and, we, and we create doctrines to, to, to empower what we believe. You know, or make sure that our wife, you know, you stay in line, the Bible says right here. It's like, well, a woman should be, a man should be in charge of the house. Well, what if the woman is 30 years old in the Lord and the husband's a brand new believer? Who's going to know more about what God wants? Yeah. Well, she does anyway. If they're the same age, the truth is. <laughs> I'm joking about that part. Um, the silly stuff we do in the name of, I want to keep the word of God. All three verses. How about the rest of the Bible? How about the rest of the Bible? Why don't we take the whole context of the Bible? We're saying the Bible contradicts itself. No, I'm saying that the Bible speaks to context. 
And if you take it out of context, you can make it say whatever you want it to say. So let's pray right now. If there's a woman next to you, put your hands on her shoulder. You have to say that in, in California. <laughs> Be appropriate. So right now, let's just pray for the women here. In the name of Jesus. Come on, just say this. In the name of Jesus. We commission you into your destiny. We don't want you to be a man. We don't want you to lead like a man. We need you to be a matriarch, a mother, a queen, and a leader amongst us. And we need your help. Please help us. Jesus, please help them help us. And forgive us for the way we've sinned against women for generations. In Jesus' name, amen. There you go. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. Be sure to visit Bethel.tv for other exciting new content from Bethel Church.